My name is Phil Bloomer. I'm the director of the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, which is jointly sponsoring the event uh, with CORE. And it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be working with CORE and with Marilyn and all the other team who've done a fantastic job uh, with us uh, regarding the organisation of this event. Um, it's also very pleasing to be in the second session because I think the first session gave us a fantastic overview in terms of the major issues around access to justice, the third pillar, which we often uh, call the forgotten pillar, precisely because it has so, potentially so much teeth that that's the place where there's been least progress in many ways in the guiding principles of moving forward on that. And that was referred to both in terms of the National Action Plan for the UK, but equally in many other uh, fora. Um, you'll, of course, expect me as the Director of Business and Human Rights Resource Centre to mention also that we, as other people have said, we do have a website. It is a website that we've just, uh, we've just reformed. Um, it's, a very, it's a free public resource, so uh, you can find all about, the, um, about these issues on there. Many of the speakers of the session also have their sessions there, as does uh, CORE has many of their own uh, ele elements there as well. But this afternoon, uh, in the second session, we're really going to build on, I think, so many of the issues that came out strongly in that first session. And the uh, intention of this second session is to dig down a little deeper into some, into some, of, those, uh, into some of those areas. Um, you know, we've, we've, we're going to go into areas of, of uh, right from that grassroots company uh, remedial mechanisms, grievance mechanisms. We're going, to, we're going to see some examples of how that works and what can be achieved for, uh, for uh, victims um, f of abuse, right up to uh, and through the actions that are being taken at a national level to, uh, to, increase this, uh, to increase access to justice, and then through also to the work that's, all, uh, been, uh, that's happened with such extraordinary achievement of the uh, move towards uh, an international binding treaty, which is also uh, now happening and has been uh, gone through the Human Rights Council only uh, a fortnight ago. Um, so we're going to be looking at all those different levels. We're going to be looking across also from, uh, from government responsibility to private sector responsibility to also what all those uh, actors are doing together with civil society and, and governments in places like International Forum. So without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to introduce uh, the first of our speakers, um, and that's David Chivers from Erskine Chambers, and he's going to speak specifically about the, 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 the duty of care. Uh, just before I do talk about duty of care, and uh, with Phil's permission, I'm just going to uh, spend a moment talking about something that arose out of the last session, and it's this question of, of killing a company uh, as one of the possible remedies. I just mention it because I was involved on behalf of CORE and Tradecraft with the negotiations with the Department of Trade, now BIS, and the Minister uh, as to the formulation of the duties of care under the Companies Act in this country, the 2006 Companies Act. And the Department of Trade was adamant we weren't going to get a direct duty where victims of uh, corporate abuse could cl uh, claim directly against directors of company that uh, they were in breaches of their duties. Um, and so we said, well, if the company is guilty of, let us say, human rights abuses or severe environmental uh, degradation on an ongoing basis, uh, would you, the Department of Trade, use your powers to wind up the company in the public interest ground? And they nodded and said, well, in a suitable case, they would. So I just mention that because it is a real possibility if you can establish that a UK company uh, is guilty, it is conducting its business in a manner contrary to the public interest. And the public interest doesn't necessarily just mean that the UK public interest. Uh, then that may be a basis upon which you could attack that company uh, by persuading the Department of Trade that it was appropriate to wind it up. Anyhow, I'll now move on to my subject. And that is uh, affirming the duty. I'm going to discuss that in the context of the UK. And there's some irony in that I'm looking at changes, possible changes to the UK law to allow access to the domestic courts to remedy international human rights abuses. On the day after, the Attorney General has just been sacked 
to facilitate changes to the UK law to prevent access to international courts to remedy domestic human rights abuses. One has to bear in mind that we are um, trying to get uh, access to uh, UK law and create a uh, UK law which gives that access, but of course one always has to uh, consider what would be acceptable in terms of domestic remedies against domestic com companies um, in, in that context. There are three, I think, three primary ways in which one can approach this sort of liability. If we're looking at parent companies, foreign subsidiaries, or possibly parent importer, uh, sorry, UK importers and foreign suppliers, the, the issue may be the same. The first is to establish direct liability for the acts of that parent. Uh, and that is essentially what uh, has been done to date, where cases have been successful or, or um, on their way to being successful, CAPE, for example, uh, one can establish that the parent, and it could perhaps be an importer, takes a direct role in the activities of the subsidiary so that a duty of care will be imposed. And the focus here is on the acts of the parent. What has the parent done? Uh, a second approach is to impose liability on a parent for the acts of its subsidiary by it's called lifting the corporate veil. In other words, ignoring the separate corporate personality of the parent and the subsidiary, the, the enterprise approach. Now, under the existing law, the circumstances in which that can be done are extremely limited. And if anything, recently, they have become even more limited. Now, legislation could be enacted to provide that parent companies are liable for the acts of their subsidiaries uh, in the case of, say, human rights, or serious envir uh, environmental uh, acts uh, committed by the subsidiaries. And that was the approach put forward by the ECCJ in its fair law proposal uh, a few years ago. A third approach is to impose liability on a defendant for failing to prevent conduct of its associate. And this is a, the approach followed by the Bribery Act in the context of criminal proceedings uh, in respect of bribery. It has the advantage of fitting in well with the uh, UN guiding principles, and it's uh, flexible in, in that one can deal with questions of spheres of influence or associates rather than looking simply at a parent-subsidiary relationship. And I think that's important because many, uh, many domestic companies will conduct foreign operations through companies which not only are not subsidiaries, but by local law are not allowed to be subsidiaries. They may only have, the, the UK parent may only have a 49% uh, interest. So it's very flexible if you can uh, look at a wider approach and talk about some sort of association. I've let you all have a, a short note called Using the Bribery Act as a Model for Creating Direct Liability for the Acts of Others. This isn't quite the back of an envelope, but it's pretty close to the back of an envelope. And it's really been produced with very little thought on my part, I'm afraid. But I, I, I just thought it would be an interesting exercise to take the Bribery Act and to see uh, how easily one could turn what is a statute imposing criminal liability for allowing your associates to bribe people or failing to stop them from doing so uh, into civil liability for failing to put systems in place to prevent your associates from committing human rights abuses or environmental abuse or, or, or whatever other uh, category of liability you think is appropriate. So I've just set out uh, some proposed uh, wording for a section. The section applies where a person suffers damage caused by relevant conduct. What is relevant conduct is a matter for discussion, but one could look at human rights abuses, one could look at serious environmental uh, conduct. Uh, a relevant commercial organization is liable to pay damages if the relevant conduct has been undertaken by an associate, a person who's associated, and again, you can, you can mold that to, to fit the particular requirements. The uh, association under the Bribery Act uh, covers persons who perform services. That's, that's how that's looked at. But of course, uh, beyond bribery, one might want to look at things beyond providing services. Other forms of association might be appropriate. 
So one might, for example, look at uh, an associate being someone over whom you have control, someone over whom you can exercise influence, degrees of influence, perhaps dominant influence, significant influence, or possibly even someone from whom you anticipate by virtue of your relationship with them to get an economic benefit. And that could be a very flexible one as well. I'm always quite interested in that because I always feel that if money is coming up a chain or economic benefit is coming up a chain, then the person at the top of the chain should have some responsibility for the way in which that money has, has been generated or that benefit has been generated. So I think that's quite a useful sort of measure. Then, uh, in what circumstances will, must the conduct be undertaken? Well, someone who's acting in the course of the association. So if you have an agent, you appoint an agent to act for you, uh, if they are committing offences in the conduct of someone else's agency for whom they also act, then no doubt uh, you wouldn't be liable for that. Uh, so you need to show some sort of link between the person, their association with you, and what they're actually doing. And then three would be the same sort of defence as in the Bribery Act. It's a defence to prove that you had in place adequate procedures designed to prevent persons associated with you from undertaking such conduct. Now, the great advantage of using a model like that to impose civil liability is that it's already in the legislation in the context of an imposition of criminal liability. And criminal liability, of course, has to be established generally to a higher standard. So if the legislature is prepared to impose effectively strict liability subject to a defense where the burden is put onto the defendant, then from a civil perspective, I see no reason why the same model shouldn't be applied. There can't be any uh, point of principle to say that it shouldn't be applied in that way. Also, the point that Seema uh, mentioned uh, in relation to the amnesty study, it's not difficult to provide for the reversal of the burden of proof in an appropriate case. So if one wants to elevate certain classes of conduct uh, into a category where the burden of proof will be reversed, uh, one could do that. One could say, as I've written in four, where there's been relevant conduct, uh, and B has suffered damage. So you show conduct by A, the foreign subsidiary, you show damage by B, and if the conduct is very serious, and again, one can define that and categorize that in particular ways, but if the conduct is sufficiently serious, and there's a reasonable possibility that the relevant conduct has caused or contributed to the damage, so there's a threshold test. Uh, you can't say that you've um, suffered damage in, 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 in South Africa uh, if, if a barrel of oil has been spilled in Libya. You've got to show some sort of proximity. But if there was that proximity, if you could show the threshold test, uh, then at that point you reverse the burden of proof and it would be for the defendant to say this conduct did not cause that particular damage. So that's uh, a brief outline of a model say it is really back of the envelope and it's just meant to provoke some sort of discussion and consideration. I didn't see in principle why, uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, provisions such as this should not be enacted. From a political standpoint, there is the advantage that the Bribery Act has been enacted. So there is a model uh, which is in place where these sort of tests are already applicable. And interestingly, where, where the corporate world didn't scream or shout uh, when this came into force. And I suspect they didn't scream or shout because it's very difficult for them to say, we shouldn't be liable when people bribe on our behalf. Well, the extent to which they can say, we shouldn't be liable when people commit human rights abuses on our part is, is, is the same sort of test. And I, I think that's the, perhaps the foot in the door. So there is clearly a, a debate to be had as to how liability, uh, sorry, how the duty should be affirmed, what model is the best model. Uh, I had been working, as I say, on the ECCJ, imposing liability for the parent for the acts of the subsidiary. I think the result of this sort of approach is much, much the same. But certainly in the UK, I think the Bribery Act may be something uh, that can be used as a model and that uh, 
the third uh, model, the third approach, may be one uh, which can have some traction politically uh, as well as uh, from a legal standpoint. Thank you.